Okay, so let's get into the first piece of this course. This is kind of perhaps the easiest day, um, mainly because what we're going to be talking about is really non-spatial. It can be very simple data that we're dealing with. So in the very simplest case, it might be a single investigator going out and working in a single place. And really the only thing we're asking for is multiple samples through time. So it could be going out here in the botanical garden and listing the bird species each day that we run into. And the question is, when can we stop and say, okay, that's the whole bird fauna of this botanical garden, okay? And I bet each of you, or most of you, have participated in some sort of effort like that. A botanical survey of sampling mosquito vectors of disease at, sampling the herps of, right? But it can be a very difficult question to know, when am I done? Or worse yet, how do I know that species X is not here, right? If I do my inventory to the point where the inventory is complete, and that species is not on my list, then it should be absent. But how sure am I of that? So that's essentially what today is about. Okay, today's all about how do I assess how complete inventories are. I'll take it, in a little while, I'll take it a bit farther and talk about how to design regional inventory efforts or uh, multiple sampling efforts. So, again, the, the basic situation where you need today's content is you go out and you sample a site and you want to be able to say, I'm done, okay? But the same questions come back around when we're dealing with all of these huge data resources that now exist. So your supervisor says, I want a diagnosis of, you know, the birds of Nigeria. And you look on GBIF or on VertNet or wherever, and you see, oh, look, there are 100,000 records of Nigerian birds online. Cool. Right? And yet, you don't know how good those Lots and lots and lots of inventories are. Nigeria is a very diverse country. Has mountains, has lowlands, has interior drylands, has humid coastal areas. So how do we know when we're done? And there the question is multiplied essentially by the number of sites across the country. So all of the questions that today we're mostly going to look at on a single site basis. On Wednesday, we're gonna come back and look at them on a geographic basis, okay? So this really should be easy. I look on GBIF and I find that there are 400 bird species known from Nigeria and 300 of them have been found here and only 50 of them have been found there. So here's something that goes towards Adolfo's day. There's my hotspot, right? I found the place where most of those species occur. So it really ought to be easy. But there are some problems. First of all is that most sites on Earth 
have not been surveyed in detail. Okay, so our knowledge curve has a few sites that are very well known, and then a huge number of sites that are very poorly known. And you'll see me giving a lot of examples with birds, because that's what I do, right? That's, that's my specialty. The terrible truth is that birds are the best known taxon. So anything I say about birds is more true if you happen to work with herbs or plants or whatever. For most places on earth, birds are the best known taxon. And so it follows that for any other group, these gaps and these problems with lack of completeness will be bigger. What's worse is that a lot of taxa are hard to survey. Some of them are very cryptic or very seasonal. Worse yet, many taxa are not even well known as far as their basic diversity. I had a very good friend whose specialty was staphylinid beetles. He was a brilliant evolutionary biologist. He had all sorts of neat synthetic evolutionary questions about the beetles he studied. And he spent the first 30 years of his career describing species and describing species and describing species, because everywhere he went, it was another 10 species new to science. The one that lived under the shelf fungus, the one that lived on top of the shelf fungus, the one that lived on the rodent's back, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, this colleague died at age 58, and so he spent his first 30 years just trying to get ready to ask the exciting questions, and then he died. So a lot of attacks are like that, where you have to wade through the species descriptions before you can do the synthetic studies that you're really interested in. It gets worse, which is to say, there are all sorts of biases and problems that, that jump in. Um, how is sampling distributed in space and time? When we're dealing with heterogeneous data, we need to assure that we don't have taxonomic errors entering in. For example, I'm, I'm working on a, a completeness evaluation of the digital accessible knowledge of the birds of the world right now. It's 85 million records. There are digital accessible data for almost 90% of the bird species on Earth. So that puts us at around 9,000 bird species for which there is digital data out there somewhere. 9,000 species, but if you look amongst those 85 million records, there are more like 24,000 names. And so I've spent months of my life just correcting those names. So, you know, when it's your data, single investigator goes out birding in Kirstenbosch, or goes out looking at dragonflies in Kirstenbosch or whatever, it's fairly easy because we're going to imagine that you use the same taxonomy. But as soon as it becomes a group effort, it's very easy for one person to be using one generic name and another person to be using another. So we get into all these problems with, with data quality, essentially. If we could do this task well, which is to say, produce robust estimates of how complete inventories are, it would be a big step forward in biodiversity science. Because we'd be able to decide which sites are well known, 
which species are absent from those sites, etc. Okay? Now here's kind of more of the reality. Sorry, Adolfo, this is another Mexico illustration. But this is kind of the reality. That's the distribution of sampling of birds in Mexico before 1900. And all I want you to see is that these points line up along access routes, the old roads, okay? Which is to say, in the biodiversity world, we never have our, our sampling spread nice and evenly across geography. Instead, what we always see is that, well, we can get to this area, and we can't get to this area. In fact, Adolfo's and my students are really the only biologists who've ever worked this region. And there's all sorts of neat stuff there. But there's one mountain range right about here where I, one other ornithologist and a botanist, are the only biologists who've been on that mountain range. And so these gaps and these sampled areas and the spaces in between them are kind of a universal feature of biodiversity data. We have gaps in time as well. I, I already showed you a different view of this th same thing, but here's the accumulation of um, information about Mexican birds through time. And you see before 1870, there are some data in there, but it's very, very, very few. And then we get more and more, and then actually less. These are specimen data. And so really it's only a couple labs that are still collecting birds in Mexico. Adolfo's, mine, not many more. Back in the glory days, there were many groups collecting in Mexico, accumulating new knowledge. There were even professional collectors who, who their job was to go collect at sites and then sell the specimens to, to museums. So we have, to, we have to get a way of dealing with our data that takes into account kind of irregularities in space and irregularities in time. And so we need to think quite a bit about what we do before we start extracting interesting results. So otherwise, those interesting results may turn out to be artifacts. So here's another illustration of how essentially most sites on Earth lack data. This is for birds in Mexico. And essentially all I want you to see is these, these are different measures of knowledge. Um, this is at the top is overall number of, of records per pixel. Um, this is specimens per species. And this is birds, oh sorry, expected and, and realized. And all I want you to see is that this lowest category in each case is the one that dominates. So these are the poorly known places and species, and anything that is out here would be well known. Okay? So whenever, whenever anybody tells you, oh, well, why do you need to do biodiversity work? Don't we already know? No. Uh, So there's another dimension of the problem, and that is that biodiversity is too big. When we use, think about the title of today's work, it's inventory. So if you run a store, right, if you're selling candy, and if you do an inventory, let's say you close the store for a week, and you do your inventory, 
At the end of that week, you know that you have 532 chocolate bars and 220, I don't know, whatever. There's no error bars, there's no estimation, there's no statistics. That is the number. It's an inventory. But biodiversity really is, in general, too broad. So very rarely, and only in a few taxa, and in circumscribed places, can we do an inventory. Usually what we have to do is some sort of sampling. We can't go out and identify every single individual, except possibly with, with African megafauna or something like that. But in general, we have to do some sort of sampling. And so we sample until in some sense we feel confident that we've either touched every individual with our sampling or that we've at least identified every species. If we've identified every species, then in a biodiversity inventory sense, we're done. So the question is, how do we get that confidence that our inventory is complete? That's essentially the challenge. Um, as I said, sampling is aimed towards estimating some quantity, and generally it's going to be species numbers. I would argue to you that the best thing we can do is make sure that we get our single site house in order first. Everybody know the difference between alpha and beta diversity? Alpha, beta, gamma diversity? Alpha is point diversity. Beta is how we change from moving from one point to another. And gamma? Gamma is not. I think now we're increasing scale. It, just call it the sum of, of alpha and beta, yeah. the combination of them. So if your supervisor says, I want to know, you know, I want an inventory of the birds of Nigeria, the gamma diversity is simply the whole set of species that occur anywhere in Nigeria. Let's say it's 500 species. Are all 500 of those species present at every site across Nigeria? No. Maybe only 200 are set present at a given site. And then maybe you drive 10 kilometers down the road and there are 200 species there. How many species total have you detected between this site and this site? It's somewhere between 200 if they have the same set of species and 400 if they're completely non-overlapping. And surely it's going to be somewhere in the middle. But the difference between alpha and beta diversity, which is to say alpha diversity are those single site values of 200 and 200, and beta diversity, which can be defined in many different ways. Beta diversity is essentially the turnover in the two faunas, how different those two faunas are. And you can imagine putting those two things together and you get the sum total of species in the country. But imagine you're Raphael and you want to do a conservation prioritization of Nigeria. If there are 500 species in the country and all of them are present at every point in the country, alpha diversity high, beta diversity zero, then it's pretty easy. You just pick the biggest chunk of, of land that you can set aside and you set it aside. But what do you do as those faunas or floras get different over space? I have these 200 species here and a different 200 species here and a different set here. All of a sudden, 
we have to do some sort of network of sites. We can't just take one big site. So the best thing you can do is to understand the biota, whatever your interest is, of the single sites profoundly and quantitatively so that you can then understand the turnover from site to site. Because that turnover, presence is kind of easy. You saw it or you didn't. Absence is horrible. Usually the species that generate absences are usually rare species and so the, they can be the hard ones to detect. So it's only via rigorous inventories that you can establish those ab absences. If you are confident that you have detected 99% of the species present at a site, then you know how much confidence you can give to not having detected a particular species at the site. Everybody with me? We've already talked about that.